James, um, welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us. Um, we have an incredible session planned for tonight and I have the pleasure of introducing our two speakers. Um, so Dr. Uh, Mike Asandi is the inaugural chief uh, or sorry, inaugural vice chair of education in the Department of Emergency Medicine at Stanford University. He is the principal and founder of the Pre Precision Education and Assessment Research Lab, the Pearl, co-director of the scholarly concentration in medical education and a distinguished member of the Stanford Medicine Teaching and Mentoring Academy. Dr. Gassandi is a medical education researcher and an expert in the application of social media and medical education. He is a member of the editorial boards of Academic Life and Emergency Medicine and International Clinician Educators blog, and he is associate editor of the textbook Emergency Medicine. Dr. Gassandi is the recipient of numerous teaching awards, including the National Faculty Teaching Award of the American College of Emergency Physicians and the Hal Jane Excellence in Teaching and Education Award of the Society for Academic Emergency Medicine. That's enough. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> guy Mike is here to talk. All there's right. More. <laughs> no, there's no more. It's fine. Uh <laughs> All right. Thank and you. we also have Dr. Ale Alvarez, who is a national leader and educator on wellness, diversity, equity, and inclusion. He's a clinical associate professor of emergency medicine and well-being director at the Stanford Emergency Medicine. He co-leads the Human Potential Team and serves as the Stanford EM Physician Wellness Fellowship Director and Chair of the Stanford WellMD's Physician Wellness Forum. His work focuses on humanizing phys physician roles as individuals and teams by harnessing our individual human potential in the context of high-performance teams. This includes optimizing the interconnectedness between process improvement, quality and clinical operations, recruitment, diversity and representation, and well-being, inclusion and be belonging. He is one one of the 2021-2022 faculty fellows at the Stanford Virus Institute Center for Biodesign. Welcome to you both. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight, um, and we are really looking forward um, to your talk. Well, thanks so much for having us. I always feel badly that we write these bios that then get um, read in public like that because it takes like five minutes away from our lecture. So we have lots to talk about, and uh, we've already used five minutes up, so we're going to go faster now. So uh, it's really a pleasure to be here with Dr. Alvarez. We've got a, uh, a big title there, uh, using social media to promote your career, justice, uh, equity, diversity, inclusion, and well-being. So we have lots to talk about for us to get through all of that. Um, I do want to say we have nothing to disclose. This is a talk about social media, so there are Twitter handles, and feel free to tweet at us um, questions or comments uh, during or after the lecture. We'll, we'll be happy to answer them. And that uh, really is a pleasure to be here. So, I, you know, I thought for my portion, I'm going to speak for about 25 minutes and then LA will do the same and we'll take some questions. So that's sort of the, 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 the map of the, um, the hour. But I could have gone in a lot of different directions uh, for this talk. We, we did come up with some objectives. So we um, want you to be able to list some benefits of using social media for professional careers. Certainly, we find a lot of benefits for it. Um, we want you to help you select the best platforms to use to promote your academic work, and then describe some ways that social media can advance JEDI. Um, but I have my own agenda, um, and then LA has his. So um, for me and my portion of the talk, I want to talk about how to promote your career using social media in a four important ways. So one is to build your platform, and not your social media platform, but your societal platform. And I'm going to focus a lot of my time on that um, particular concept. We'll talk about how to promote your professional brand, how to choose the right social media for the job that you need to complete, and then how to contribute content to the uh, discussion that's occurring in the online space. So just like two minutes about me and my journey uh, to tonight's talk, um, I had no social media presence prior to 2014. In fact, I've never had a Facebook account. So I'm giving you a, uh, a talk on social media. I consider myself an expert in social media for MedEd. I've never had Facebook account. Um, and I attended this lecture from a San Francisco School of Medicine grad uh, called From Twitter to Tenure at a professional society meeting in uh, 2014. And, you know, it was about the power of social media disseminating new knowledge that if you um, wrote a blog post about a topic, it would instantly go around the world and be read by thousands and thousands of people the day that you send the, the keystroke, as opposed to the same information being published in a medical journal taking a year or more to get to print. And then, you know, you have to pub edit and find it. Who's ever really going to read that information? I found this dissemination argument very compelling. 
I also thought, well, I want tenure, so I'm going to join Twitter because that's what the name of the panel was. So that's the day I joined Twitter. And from there, you know, I've had kind of a, a interesting eight years. I now teach a freshman um, undergrad class here at Stanford called Does Social Media Make Better Physicians? I've published a bunch of papers on social media and its use in medical education. I got a grant to put on an international conference last year called Infodemic that looked at social media and COVID-19 misinformation. Um, from that, I became the um, guest editor of a, a special JMIR theme issue on social media, ethics, and COVID-19 misinformation. And I think most importantly, over these last eight years, I've built this really interesting professional network of people that I've met online. I've, in fact, spoke um, in four different countries at professional society meetings on, on the invitation of people who I made friends with online, which kind of sounds a little creepy, but you know, these were uh, other medical professionals who, uh, you know, we began tweeting at each other and, and sharing um, content and, and, and shared interests and, and developed a digital community of practice, uh, is what I refer to it as, and, uh, you know, developed these bonds that uh, led to invitations to speak around the world. And certainly, if one was to look at my CV right now, a huge portion of the um, publications I have, the speaking engagements like tonight and otherwise, really are a result of my time on social media. So I would say like, you can't just sort of join Twitter tonight and you're gonna have you know 10,000 followers and, and you're gonna be very uh, productive. It really is a journey. It takes some time and some planning and some dedication. That's what we're here to talk with you about tonight is how to strategically navigate social media such that your career really will benefit from it uh, the ways that um, it has for Dr. Alvarez and I. All right, so I said I had four uh, agenda items. So let's start with platform. So imagine at Stanford, there's this um, professor who's an expert in this one little telomere on this one little chromosome. You probably know her. Um, she goes to the uh, conference for the one little telomere on the one little chromosome where she interacts with the other eight people in the world that study that one little telomere on that one little chromosome. And she publishes in the journal of the one little telomere on the one little chromosome. And when she goes up for promotion in the professoriate at Stanford, we will judge whether she has national reputation. So that, that's the jump. So when you're um, joining our faculty uh, in a few years, you'll be um, a, an instructor perhaps, or you'll start as an assistant professor. And the assistant professor needs a regional reputation to go up to associate professor. And the associate professor needs a national reputation. And our national reputations often are built upon letters of recommendation that are written by other um, successful scholars in our field. So the other 10 people that study the one little telomere on the one little chromosome would write letters of support and that would um, somehow buttress the national reputation argument uh, for this professor. And I you know, and she probably would get promoted and do, you know, she's an expert and she should be promoted. However, you know, I, I kind of think that that's just like a small little pond and she's publishing in this tiny little journal that nobody reads. She's going to this conference that nobody goes to, and her work's really not getting out there. And I would argue that perhaps what we really should be looking at is platform, societal platform for promotion. So what do I mean by that? That means if you're a public figure, like a university professor, a physician at a, at a major university, what level of audience do you command? And in a similar way of thinking about this is if you have um, an author for a book, and they, they go to a publishing house and they want to publish their book, how many people are going to buy their book based upon what platform they carry? So where they're from, what their um, profession is, what uh, uh, the, you know, the number of followers they have on various social media platforms, that determines their, their overall platform. And there's some really great books that I'm going to recommend that help get this concept of platform across. One of them is called Platform, Get Noticed in a Noisy World by Michael Hyatt, which is an awesome book. And in it, um, uh, Hyatt argues that success in business equals a compelling product plus a meaningful platform. And we know that that formula is exactly on point when we watch Shark Tank, right? You have all these great inventors who will come in with their new um, products and they want to bring them to the big box stores. They want to bring them to scale nationally, but they need the sharks to help give them the platform, right? They need the sharks influence to be able to get them into Bed Bath & Beyond and Target and what, wherever it is that they want to sell um, their products. They need that platform. I would argue, this is my uh, uh, formula, that academic promotion should be similarly a compelling scholarship, so similar to the product, um, and then you know adequate dissemination of your expertise, so a similar platform concept. So you need to be able to get your information out there, this um, expertise in the one little telomere on the one little chromosome, it needs to be sent um, out in the world in, in uh, uh, you know, a large scale. And it brings us to this idea that the old adage of publish or perish, where if you didn't publish enough papers, 
you wouldn't get promoted. And you know, there's another adage, the dean can count, but the dean can't read, right? So it, it doesn't even matter what some of these papers are, it's just as long as you're prolific enough that you're putting them out there. Maybe that should be replaced, right? By this concept of visible or vanish. Visibility online really matters um, as you build your platform. And perhaps that should be what we we're looking at uh, when we look at professoriate promotions. Um, I attended this course at Harvard Medical School. I'll say this is one of the best courses uh, I've ever attended. Um, it's a, a several day course for physicians who wanna be authors. Um, and you see the title of the course there. And they um, talk quite a bit about platform uh, for aspiring authors and uh, how to use social media to build that platform. And I would really recommend that conference for you. Um, I myself have three tips for how to build your platform. I, I think you need a consistent professional brand. I think you have to con consider and uh, choose the correct social media platform to build your platform, if you will. And they need to be able to produce relevant content. So let me kind of take those each uh, one by one. So in terms of your professional brand, let me say a word or two about brands. So if, if there was a coffee machine um, uh, next to the entrance to the ED, you know, the kind you put money in and you know, it squirts a little coffee into a cup for you, you know, vending machine. And there was a Starbucks right next to that same vending machine. Um, and they serve the exact same Starbucks coffee. I would always go to the counter and buy coffee from the Starbucks and I'd pay much more money to do so than I would um, out of a machine, even if it was the exact same coffee. Why is that? It's because I'm a Starbucks junkie. I really am in, in real life. I buy the holiday drink every single day in December. Um, I had one today. Um, and, uh, you know, I believe in the brand. I, I get consistent product every, everywhere I go in the country when I buy Starbucks. Um, I kind of believe in their social mission in many ways. So, you know, I'll throw down a couple extra bucks to buy that, um, that coffee. Brand really matters. And Bezos has a great quote for this. So your brand is what other people tell uh, say about you when you're not in the room. So you have to control what your brand is. You, you need to Google yourself. And what comes up when you Google yourself is really important. And how can you control what a Google search says about you um, when one is done. That, you know, that's control of your brand. That's a brand audit. Um, and you want to make sure your brand image, what you think of yourself, uh, or your brand identity, rather, what you think of yourself aligns with your brand image, which is what other people think about you. So having a consistent online brand is really important to building that platform. So here's mine. So I call this the black shirt photo because uh, I was wearing a black shirt when I took it. And in the same photo is um, really everywhere on the internet where you can find my photo. I've gone to painstaking um, uh, lengths to make sure that I've taken down old photos to the degree that I can find them. I always find a new one every now and again, but in most places you'll find this, this photo. And that's because when folks are just learning about a new brand, seeing the same logo and the same message over and over matters. And that, that counts when people are learning about a new um, uh, a person in society, a celebrity or otherwise, that the same message or the same image needs to be um, drilled over and over and over again for them to quickly uh, recognize who you are. Um, also, your tagline matters, your elevator pitch for your work really matters. And I'm a medical education researcher, so my tagline is my research improves patient care. Everything we do must improve patient care. Um, by developing the most effective ways to train physicians. And you'll find that tagline everywhere that, um, you, you know, that I would have one online. So here's my photo on a bunch of different websites. Uh, here's my personal website. Um, and you know, on it is my tagline where you can read about my research and look at my old papers and things like that. I do think that you should stay on brand. Once you've built a brand, you should be, you should be sharing content online on whatever platform uh, that you're using, if it's Twitter, you're tweeting about the same messages. So for me, my brand uh, includes medical education. That's what I do. It includes emergency medicine. That's what I do. And it includes things about Stanford. I love the Stanford Cardinal. I love the tree. I bleed Cardinal red. Um, and I think it's fun to tweet about my students uh, and their accomplishments. So part of my brand image is to, is to tweet about Stanford. Now, I did break my, my rule once, and that was at the end of 2020, actually really through, throughout the latter half of 2020, um, when there was so much COVID misinformation going on. And I thought like Frank lies from um, uh, during the presidential election. And I, I don't know about you, but 2020, I was very emotional about going to work. Um, you know, at the very beginning of the pandemic, I was, I was an emergency physician. I was very scared to go to work. Um, and, you know, then I would watch on TV lies about... Um, uh, about COVID, misinformation, disinformation that was very obvious to me, and I couldn't understand how it wasn't obvious to the rest of the world. So I began rage tweeting, honestly, 
uh, about this um, throughout most of 2020. And I, I sort of, you know, reined it in after the presidential election, but I felt like I built this platform, right? I'm a, I'm a physician at a major university and I have, you know, X number of Twitter followers. And why would I not use my platform for public health education, if not, um, uh, you know, now at this time of a crisis, right? If I didn't use my platform, would I be sort of abdicating my role as a professional in society? So I, you know, I really did lean into these other ways of using my platform. But generally, I stay, I stay pretty much on target if you watch um, what I tweet online. Now, one big digital platform, um, uh, a digital brand rather uh, pitfall is to publish, uh, post about patients. I, I really think you shouldn't do this. I think it's a third rail, especially when you're just starting out on social media. It's really tempting to take that head CT image that was super cool today, you know, take the name of the person off of it and then put it online and say, look how cool this was. What's the diagnosis? And you'll see this all the time on Twitter and other platforms. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's sort of interesting to look at those images, but they're totally discoverable. And particularly if that patient was just seen today, the chances are that patient, you know, follows your Twitter account is, is quite high. Just uh, a month ago, I walked into a patient's room and, and you know, uh, she, the patient was in bed and her husband's sitting in a chair and says, look, honey, um, he's not just a pa uh, physician on Twitter. He's a physician in real life. And I was really taken aback by this. And, you know, it's the reality that with the app, the My Health app, uh, you know, patients know who their physicians are before we walk in the room. And this, this particular uh, patient, her husband Googled me and found my Twitter account. And, and I was like, what did I just put on Twitter, you know, this morning, I hope it was legitimate, right? So they, they totally know what we're posting. So you have to be very careful to not post about patients. Now, there are ways to de-identify patient information online. So if you were going to show an image, you know, you take the name off, etc. If it makes sense with the case content, you switch the gender, you wait six months, you add or subtract 10 years in age, you do a lot of things to sort of de-identify it. But I would argue, just don't do it. I think it's a lot easier. Uh, and there are other ways to contribute content that I'm gonna share in just a moment. All right, so next you gotta select the correct social media platform for the job. And there's a lot of them out there. Um, and I think of them as tools in a toolbox, right? So if you were going to go screw um, a screw into the wall, you wouldn't use a hammer, right? You'd use a screwdriver. So each of these platforms have their own sort of nuances that allow you as um, uh, a physician uh, uh, or a scientist to uh, get your, your information out there kind of in a little bit different ways, you know, different nuanced ways. You have to sort of think about what those different uh, differences are. So, you know, you've got LinkedIn. LinkedIn is sort of a, you know, a self-promotional uh uh, website, I think, you know, this is where you you post a lot of things about yourself and you hope headhunters find you in the, in the valley and hire you to be, you know, consulting for their startup or whatever. Um, then you've got Instagram. And, you know, Instagram is not just about posting uh, family photos. There's a lot of physician influencers on Instagram who are, who are very successful. This is owner Yenigan. He graduated from our program a couple of years ago. Uh, many of you may remember him. He has a ton of followers on Instagram and he posts you know, a picture of himself and scrubs or whatever every day with a really interesting message for uh, his followers. It's usually about his hard day and the lesson he learned and what have you. In this particular uh, post, he was talking about myth busting about the COVID vaccine. And, you know, you may not want to be a phys physician influencer, but you have to give respect to those that are who have millions of followers that their posts influence that are, you know, that are lay public that are listening to what this physician has to say. And, and perhaps that's where you want to get your message out. And that's the role that you want to play um, with your professional brand. And, and Instagram can be uh, very useful for that. And then we have TikTok, right? And this is um, Sandra Lee, Dr. Pimple Popper uh, in this example. Um, she, you know, really uh, serves a great role um, in on TikTok, as do many physicians on TikTok who are there to um, uh, refute um, medical uh, misinformation or disinformation. There are um, skin fluencers, right? These um, young uh, celebrities who uh, teach teenagers like my daughter how to how to take care of their skin online, who have millions and millions of followers, and they'll tell you to like Windex your zits or whatever. And you know it can be very harmful to your skin. And Dr. Uh, Pimple Popper will go online and refute. Um, some of these claims. And, you know, that's a very important role that physicians are playing more and more on TikTok. So picking the right platform matters. Then there's Twitter, which I will say is, is my favorite. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, what's happened in the last month makes Twitter a little uh, shaky right now. But, you know, certainly it uh, is the dominant platform, I think, for medical professionals, whether, um, 
you know, whether uh, we like what's going on right now or not. Um, you know, I'll say uh, I teach this undergrad class and I start uh, every session of my undergrad class asking what platforms everyone's on. And, you know, so if you're a freshman undergrad, everyone's on Twitter um, and Snapchat, uh, which I don't really know how to use Snapchat for medical education. I'm still trying to figure it out. I'm going to figure it out. Um, but, you know, some of them are on Instagram. No one's on Twitter. All right. And if you take those of you listening to this lecture today, I don't know, maybe half of you will be on Twitter, maybe less than. Uh, and, you know, most folks are on Instagram. Probably none of you are on Facebook. If you take the faculty, I would say most of us have uh, a Facebook account, though I don't. You know, most are on Twitter if they're online at all. Um, and then you know, certainly have Instagram for family photos and things, and, and then you know can't imagine themselves on TikTok. So it's generational in many ways. But if you want to speak to other medical professionals online, I think Twitter is a place that you have to go. So here's just some tips for getting started on Twitter. So first, download it on your phone. That's pretty easy. It's a low activation energy. Upload a professional headshot. So there's my black fo uh, shirt photo. Write a very brief description of yourself um, and uh, you know include some professional information there. Search for the blog post, Mom, This Is How Twitter Works. It's actually a really great blog post. The only caveat is it was written a, a long time ago. So the 140 character limit's now 280, right? But otherwise, all the little intricacies of Twitter is explained in this blog post. It's outstanding. Then compose your first tweet. Follow 10 medical professionals. If you just follow Dr. Alvarez, he retweets so many wonderful medical professionals out there that you'll, um, you'll get uh, a sense of who's posting what in what area very quickly. Um, and then I think you should post clinical pearls and importantly, your thoughts on research publications. And this is where you can start to build your brand as a scientist or a physician online. And I'll show you how to do that in just a second. And then again, never post about a patient ever. So contributing content. I think um, content uh, contribution is knowledge translation in the digital era. And this is what I teach in my undergrad class. You know, knowledge translation on social media is really about knowledge dissemination and exchange uh, and it's, you know, the aim is to improve uh, public health, uh, to improve the health of our patients. Um, so, you know, it is our job to, to take um, scientific findings and bring them uh, in an accessible manner to other physicians to change their practice, right? Or to bring them to um, the lay public to change their behavior. That is knowledge translation. And I think about it like, like curation in um, a museum, right? So a curator knows exactly what artifact to bring into the museum at a certain time for a certain audience, right? So they, they curate um, art. And there are curators of uh, medical content. You can be one of those uh, tonight uh, very easily. Uh, and, and that curation starts to help build your, your image, your professional brand um, uh, image for others. And I'll explain this through the Jeff Friedle phenomenon. So there's this guy, Jeff Friedel, who is at USC. He's an emergency physician, medical educator, and a uh, good friend. And when Jeff Riddell um, tweets something, you know, particularly an article that he likes, I'll stop what I'm doing and I'll read the article. And I'll tell you every time I like the article that he uh, tweets, we, we share similar interests within the field of medical education. And I find, you know, his articles that he selects very interesting. So the Jeff Riddell phenomenon is very real for me. You know, when he curates something, I stop and, and look at it. And there's something there, there, when we think about knowledge translation, this is what I teach in my class or something there, there. So uh, so this is how you're going to share information. You're going to curate content for others in medicine. So um, you could go to PubMed if you find an interesting article. And there's a little share button down there uh, where the arrow is. And if you clicked on Twitter, you'd get uh, this sort of boring tweet uh, that looks like this. Now, if you're um, using Twitter and you're scrolling through, you're not going to stop at this. It's, you know, it's a title of an article and without any context. And then, you know, the PubMed link. And the likelihood that someone's going to engage with your tweet, meaning they're going to actually click on the thing that you're posting, is probably pretty low. So you need to kind of do a little bit of um, editing and make it more uh, appealing to the to the reader. Now, I would also argue that you should use um, the links uh, for articles that come from the journal websites themselves. So if you click on like the full text link from PubMed, then you'll be brought to the to the journal that the article came from, and you can use their share button and it increases the article level metrics, the alt metrics for that particular article, which um, uh, supports the career of the authors who wrote that article, which I think is good karma juju you should pay forward. So you should go and share uh, from the, the journal's website. So if I click the share button here for academic medicine, I'm going to get this, which is actually a worse tweet, frankly, than PubMed. It's, it's 
you know, unintelligible. So you have to clean it up a little bit. So here's a way I cleaned it up. I put the title and then I put via academic medicines um, Twitter handle because likely academic medicine will will retweet this um, to their 10 or 20,000 followers. And that's instantly, um, you know, some FaceTime uh, with Twitter users for me as I build my brand. I also put my co-authors as a pipe of mine. I put my co-authors and then I put the Twitter handles from their respective departments, thinking those departments will retweet me as well. And then there's the link. But this is still not a very compelling tweet, right? Like there's nothing here that's drawing you in. It's just sort of, you know, a, a bunch of uh, uh, handles, uh, if you will. So all you need to do is change it up and put a compelling question at the top. So this particular article is about how there are less and less bedside procedures uh, for trainees and there are more and more trainees and you guys are competing at the bedside for these procedures, and that's a problem, and we have to address that as educators. So all I wrote was, where have all the LPs gone? And like that might bring you in. That's interesting. There is literature to suggest um, the use of uh, numbers, data points. So you know something dropped by 50% in the last year, right? It's almost like clickbait, um, uh, if you will, but you know for, uh, for academic articles. But it does increase the engagement with that particular um, tweet, if we're using Twitter in this case. Um, but the same thing can be said for a post on LinkedIn or whatever. Um, so this is just a way, I think, of, of finding something you thought was interesting today. Every one of you is gonna read a journal article you know, in the next day or two. And if you find one that's really interesting, take, take you know, five minutes, click the little share button, write a little tweet about it. It'll take you no time at all. Um, and I usually do this when I'm in line at the grocery store, like that's the cognitively the amount of time that I spend on Twitter. You know, you think that the guy giving the talk spends a lot of time. I spend less than five minutes on Twitter a day, 100% uh, less than five minutes. Um, and I'll, you know, I'll scroll for a few minutes and see what my friends are talking about. And then I'll post whatever article or my, you know, whatever thing about Stanford and I'll call it a day. And that's, you know, sort of my daily post. Um, so I think there are some golden rules when you're thinking about contributing content. One is to curate that content. We just talked about that at length. The next is daily posting. And I do think daily posting is really important as you're building your professional brand. There's some consistency um, to the messaging that you're using, particularly if you're gonna stay on topic. So let's say um, your topic is um, uh, gun safety. You know, you should have some, some posts most of the week. You know, there should be a post about, you know, some issue related to gun safety, if not an article or popular press article that you want to share, what, what have you. You can, you can, you know, be off brand a couple of times, but most of the week you need to be on brand. And then I use this give and take rule. So for every time I take something from Twitter, um, you know, I need to give, give back. Um, so every time I, you know, take five things, so if I've learned five things from Dr. Alvarez, then it's my, my time to um, put something out there myself for others to learn from. So in the end, I want you to be a lurker for a little while. I want you to join these social media sites, follow some medical professionals, see what they're talking about online, start to dip your toe in and be an intermittent contributor after some time. But eventually I'd like you to be um, professionals in an online space that have big platform and that truly have influence on others in your field um, on uh, your fellow trainees and on the patients who follow you and be a heavy contributor. Put, put a post out a day that has something uh, meaningful from your field. Um, so with that, uh, heavy contributors, I'm going to stop here and turn the slide deck over to Dr. Alvarez and let him um, uh, take the microphone. And I'm happy to take questions at the end if you guys want, but we'll let him, uh, we'll let him chat. Thanks, Dr. Jazandi. Um, I'm going to be sharing my screen here, and this always happens. Uh, somehow when I do it, my mouse thing disappears. So you should be seeing my screen, uh, Legos, or whatever that thing is. Yep, we do. Awesome. Great. So I'm going to put it, things together now, and then hopefully we can be a lot more interactive in this part, or at least get you to uh, uh, try some new things. So... We talked about uh, Twitter accounts and Instagram and Facebook, TikTok, uh, and uh, Dr. Jazandi really highlighted several of these platforms. I shared with you in the screen there or uh, in the chat earlier about uh, accessing this list. Feel free to use it um, because then you can uh, uh, create a list of people that you want to follow uh, to just create a community within uh, the, the GME diversity team. Again, as Dr. Jazani said, uh, we're going to focus on Twitter. And I know there's a lot of things that's been happening with uh, 
uh, Twitter and Elon Musk. And then actually, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some tips on how to avoid many of these really nonsense things that uh, keep on popping up on Twitter right now. And so this is what I call precision lurking. As uh, Dr. Jazandi was saying, like, you can just be a lurker. And so did you know that you can actually create lists? So these are some lists that I'm very interested in. I, I have interest in design thinking, um, humanizing position roles, as I mentioned, high performance teams. And so I just tag several of these like people that I'm interested in following. And then um, when I open Twitter, I just go directly to these lists instead of going to the, the homepage. So here's an example. I opened this earlier today, and th these are the kinds of things that show up. Q Elon or other stuff that I'm not really interested in. But if I go to my list, here are things that actually would be interesting for me from an inspirational perspective, like things like don't undercut yourself or things that um, from the AI perspective, there's several things they can follow as well. So based on themes that you're interested in. Again, let's learn how to write our own uh, first tweet. So for those of you uh, who are typing in your uh, Twitter handle, uh, that's great. Thank you for putting it in the chat. And also, again, um, much more uh, effective perhaps is to put it in the uh, the Google Doc or the, the Excel sheet that uh, I've shared, because then it allows you to keep that as a takeaway after today's session. Uh, that way you can uh, follow each other. Here's that link again. And so for those of you with Twitter, that's great. If not, uh, we can just walk you through this. Uh, because I will acknowledge that there's a lot of imposterism with the, that first tweet. And, and my goal is to at least just get you to send that first tweet. And then hopefully after that, it's going to be so much easier because I've been a lurker for a very, very long time until actually uh, Dr. Jazandi asked me, it's like, hey, you do a lot of like medical education stuff now. You should probably be on social media. It was actually not you should probably be. You should be on social media. And I'll explain why that is. So here are the basics. Literally just type something. Um, here's what I did uh, when we first talked about this back in November. And as you know, there's like character limit and that may go away, but for now it's 280 characters. And what it does is that it allows you to just get your words out. And then the next thing is to really amplify those work. So you tag people. So tag people. That's why I gave you that, that, that uh, Excel sheet so that you can start uh, tagging people from among, uh, among this group. Tag each other. So you can start now. Type something like, I am learning how to do Twitter or Twitter or like however you pronounce that. I don't know, but I'm going to try anyway because apparently it's good for my promotion. All right? Start with that one. And then you can start using hashtags. And some common hashtags in medical education are hashtag meded, hashtag um, SOMI, social media, uh, or the hashtag that I've pretty much created based on Dr. Gizandi's hashtag Loma, L-O-M-A, or the uh, land of milk and honey. So if you look up Land of Milk and Honey on Twitter, you'll see a lot of Stanford stuff that we've been doing in our department because I'm really proud of uh, all the cool things that we get to do. Here's another thing that you can do. Hashtag um, uh, Jedi. So when you when you look right now, like for Stanford OFDD and Jedi, those are the tweets that you'll see. And so it's a great way to also kind of narrow your searches for people that you're following or at least some interest that you have. Another thing to amplify, another way to amplify your work is to start adding photos. You can start tagging people, but if you tag them, that takes a lot of the characters away from that 280 characters. If you put a photo, then you can tag up to 10 people. Again, there's more than 10 here. If each of you have Twitter handles, then you can tag each other and then you can amplify each other's work. And so for me, especially with my work uh, on uh, uh, leads, uh, for those of you familiar with the, the, the lead program that James and I and several here, Dr. Jazandi actually was one of the mentors there as well, um, when I get tagged on like lead stuff, I just retweet that because it's the right thing to do. And it's always like super cool things to see announcements of like amazing things that we're doing. And so, whoops, click too fast. Um, those are the people that I keep on tagging, especially when I uh, tag them on, on lead related stuff, right? Because these are my people. That's it. Literally, you take a deep breath in, you exhale after you hit that send and move on. It's really that easy. It doesn't take a lot of time, but here's my journey as, uh, as Dr. Jazandi uh, shared with you as well, right? So for instance, if you look up like um, hashtag EM conference, uh, for the longest time, I've just been a lurker. I've just been following people. But over time, you'll actually see that I've started doing some tweets. So here's me before, oops. 
And then starting like in October 23rd, like those are the kinds of stuff that I started getting, like when I uh, posted that uh, a tweet that I shared with you earlier. And then here are other, th other ways that people are doing it. Um, they would just literally go to their conference and then type things that people are saying and then tagging them. Like Dr. Jazani just gave this nice lecture on social media. Tag him, he's gonna like it because he's gonna feel good. Like, oh, somebody was paying attention. And you're summarizing a lot of these concepts into like uh, tidbits of notes. I do this as well because for me, as part of my learning, I try to uh, really incorporate uh, the, the key learning points and summarize it in 280 characters because then it can be my like long-term notebook as opposed to forgetting it somewhere in my notes and then putting the hashtag, I can search for it easier. Again, this is me uh, prior to uh, doing any uh, social media back in 2018, zero tweet whatsoever, right? So I've only been doing this for almost four years. But then something happened in uh, August um, uh, uh, 2018. One of our lectures, one of the conferences, I started uh, tweeting about it, right? And then we had this famous person, Dr. Uh, Esther Chu, who's done a lot of work on uh, gender equity um, in, in medicine and, and, um, um, and um, uh, gender bias. And so I tweeted that. Next thing you knew, you know, like I had like over uh, 11,000 impressions on that one, one thing that I submitted. And then you just keep on following and even like Esther Chu, Dr. Chu started responding to, to, to my tweet, which then further amplified, uh, amplified that uh, the tweet, the initial tweet that I sent. Here's an example of uh, another work that I've done. Um, I went to a conference at the uh, International Conference on uh, Physician Health. I met this uh, physician, Dr. Egan, whose work is on creating amazing and awesome, uh, really celebrating wins in the department as opposed to focusing on M&M. And so I was like, you know, that's a great idea. And I, I wonder if we can try that here at Stanford. Now, I mean, also uh, specifically in emergency medicine that is resident run. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, the goal is not just to highlight save of the months, it's to highlight the entire team. And this is uh, Dr. Jessica Smith presenting this work at a national conference uh, about a, a student-led uh, wellness intervention. And I've actually never uh, really... Uh, uh, kept in touch with uh, Dr. Egan other than social media. And here we are like several years later, we're co-presenting on another different topic, uh, but it's related to wellness. When I write lectures also, if I, it's something that I find like, you know, it's gonna resonate with a lot of people, I tweet about it. So I, here's what I, I, I did back in, uh, uh, I think this is 2019. I'm, start, I'm giving this talk at the Physician Wellness Forum on loneliness and isolation, uh, on a, and specifically on physician burnout. I tagged several of my friends uh, related to wellness. Um, and then they started sharing their experiences. And I asked them, hey, I, like this is full disclosure. I'm going to give a lecture. And so like, give me your thoughts. Um, and then I created the lecture. Those are the engagements. Uh, not a lot compared to that Esther Chu uh, post, but I got like several responses. And based on that one tweet, I was able to create several lectures that I presented here as well as nationally. Dr. Zizandi also has done the same exact, uh, same thing in, uh, earlier in the year, uh, asking people about like, hey, um, I, he's working in the uh, International Commission Educators, Educators blog, ICE blog. And uh, he was looking for some ideas about uh, uh, what advice do you have for new clinician educators? And so it's pretty neat. Like I tweeted that as I was giving a lecture on social media uh, at, at a conference in uh, Dallas. And then uh, he got several people to, so that's the tweet that I essentially I did, leveraging social media. I created a, a, a QR code. And next thing you know, he's published this. And so people will then get recognized for their contributions as well. And this is just to keep it real. I posted about this talk earlier today and then like, this is a 5.45 PM. I got invited to give grand rounds based on the tweet that I just did like a few hours ago. I right? did not. I really? totally did. Look at the time. That's crazy. I know. That is crazy. So my point here is that really it can help leverage your, your career. This is an interest of yours, especially in academia. So let's talk about using uh, social media to help like inform and educate as Dr. Gizandi was sharing earlier. It's pretty cool, right? So Dr. Imane, you know her very well. Um, she posts like summaries of like papers that we've done, or even like, here's what we've done uh, in terms of lead. 
and then sharing that like so that other people can have access to it because many some sometimes like a lot of our publications are behind a firewall and so you can like screenshot that give your uh, tldr summary and then uh, share that to social media here are other things again um dr galvez uh, who was also one of our alumni here at stanford uh, created a national latino physician day and using hashtags and using social media uh, they were able to reach look at that like millions of views over a hundred thousand uh interactions and again he could have just done that in one hospital and have very little impact but instead he utilized social media to really create that impact amplifying and sponsoring other people as well again dr padilla there i'm, I'm giving it as an example so uh, i don't know if you remember dr Patton is one of our uh residents He's so proud to like mentor other people now in, in anesthesia, tagging uh, Dr. Padilla and then Dr. Padilla that adds to that. So we're just amplifying people's work, right? Not a lot of work here, 280 characters. And it really utilizes and leverages the, the platform and the brand that you're creating. And as Dr. Gizandi was uh, giving us uh, uh, some tips, we get to also manage misinformation. And so for me, I saw this, I saw, I, I respect Dr. Blackstock a lot. And so I was like, oh, let me follow that. Like, let me, let me report that person. So then um, you're able to be part of it, right? This is a great movement for us. This, so this is a, 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 one of the pictures for leads. This is really beyond just a movement. It's not just a hashtag. It's creating communities of practice beyond the confines of Palo Alto, beyond the confines of your department. And even like, this is super cool. I, I heard that Dr. Wynn uh, was here last year giving the same talk. Uh, she actually organized this in-person gathering. So we showed up like a couple of months ago in person and I've never met Dr. Wynn in person before until this event. So create something like this for yourself as well. This will be helpful as you're also recruiting, right? Here's one of my work. Um, again, uh, my, my work is on physician wellness as well. And so we're trying to normalize uh, uh, help, help seeking behaviors in, among physicians. And so uh, this was a national campaign at a society level, like a national organization level. We work with all of those other national organizations in emergency medicine to stop the stigma and, 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 and seeking mental health. And it is the largest campaign of, of our society, a society of academic uh, emergency medicine. Uh, in, in the history of SAM. So it's pretty cool. So hopefully by now we've sold you that social media can be helpful. And so let's talk about some pitfalls. So I'll talk about some of these things here. So like, I don't do social media, but really the question is, do you know what social media is saying about you? Have you Googled yourself recently? And some people may like once in a while, right? Definitely I like, check it. It's like, oh, well, like what other stuff is out there? And actually this gets tiring because eventually you'll realize like, this is me, um, I think several years ago and I checked again, it's like, well, that's not a lot of changes, which is good. That means like uh, my, my brand is consistent, right? But also you'll see sometimes like, oh, some Yelp review about my care in the emergency department. Like that's the kind of stuff that you kind of want to know a little bit about. And also this is your way of also creating and, and curating some of the work that is out there about you. And also when you start Googling yourself, there's an element here of just simply being kind to yourself because you know you cannot really control many of the things, but you have control of what you are representing yourself and, uh, and, and the institution. And so I think that is something learning the skills of, uh, of this talk will help you. Um, and there'll be haters, especially if you're gonna be picking on some controversial topics, that's okay. And especially if you have a community, your community will also be there to, to support you. And if not, also just so you know, oh, actually, there, I'll, I'll share that link later on. Um, people may be worried about getting like um, uh, harassed online. There are support systems here at Stanford, actually, that's, uh, that is built. Um, for me, Googling myself uh, or anything that I'm interested in can be tiring because I'm not that right. Like, I, I don't have it in my calendar. So you can actually just create Google alerts. So I have like my, my hashtags uh, uh, alerting me. And also like similarly, um, like my, my social media account, for instance. And so self-compassion is an area of interest of mine. So I get emails uh, on Google Scholar, like whenever something gets published on it. Same thing with high performance stuff that I'm interested in. But also I get alerts on like 
whenever there's like uh, uh, some somebody or uh, mentions me. So then the next question, I'm going to get in trouble uh, if I post on social media, right? So the key really is to understand what are the things that you should be posting? Again, Dr. Jazandi covered many of that already. Here are some policies, and I know there's a lot there. Uh, but just so you know, just set boundaries and 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 make sure you don't uh, post about patient information. And also, the next thing is like I can't be bothered, right? Because it's too much work. And I showed you it's only 280 characters, and it's really that easy. But maybe you're like, yeah, but I don't want all the dings and all the like alarms, and and it's really annoying. Well, then turn it off. And as Dr. Jazandi shared, like he only spends like five minutes with this uh, with this uh, social media platform. And then there's this concept, like what if they take my ideas? I believe in um, FOMED, so the free open access medical education. You can either hide that information uh, to yourself or you can start sharing that with other people and you can be strategic about it, right? So start sharing things that you published. Start with that and get comfortable with that. And eventually uh, you'll find that actually when you start sharing information, people are more willing to collaborate with you. And then here's that question about like, I don't want uh, people to harass me uh, after a, a specific post. And here's that resource from Stanford. Uh, when, when you find yourself like being harassed, because it happens once in a while. And honestly, like they, you just move on. You don't have to even engage with them. And if you do, alert the, contact that online harassment program. But just be very clear, what happens in social media stays in social media forever, right? People can actually uncover those, even if you delete them. So just be careful what you're posting. So here's the summary of the things that we covered. Hashtags and pictures allow you to amplify, be an ally, support people, right? Use QR code uh, if, if, if you want uh, to increase uh, sharing whenever you're presenting, right? Help with FOMO. So if you get tagged, like or tweet, uh, retweet it. And just be kind. Be kind to yourself when you get those things that you may not be happy about, report them. And also just be kind of what you're, be, what you're gonna be posting. So I'll end here. So Twitter may not be real life, but like Dr. Blockstock shared here that she found her uh, book deal through social media. And I hope each of you also will find something similar. I share with you, I got a grand rounds invitation. So by simply posting this uh, talk earlier today. And so with that, I'll pause here and then really um, um, 